bug Pokemon. Let's be. <laughs> Sorry, I just love the way that I said the word Pokemon there. <laughs> let, let me try that again. Bug Pokemon. Let's be honest, not everybody's cup of tea. Some people hate them, other people hate them. But today, I plan to not just get justice for our lovable critters, but to actually change your mind about them. How will I accomplish such a daring and daunting task? Well, I'll be embarking on a perilous journey to find, catch, and use exclusively Fulod's hyperpigmented insects to beat the Paldea region in its entirety in a hardcore nuzlocke. The stakes have never been higher. The Pokemon have never been more underappreciated and I've never been more excited to prove the world wrong. Stick around because I promise you this is going to be crazy. The intro to this game consists of about an hour and a half of unadulterated bollocks. It's just so much dialogue. It's painful. So listen, I'm not going to waste your time. Instead, we're going to skip through it. You're welcome. Okay, so now that's all over and we can actually play the game. Let's go hunt for our first critter, shall we? So there's one in mind that is pretty controversial. A lot of people despise this Pokemon and if I'm being honest, right, don't hate me for not being a hater, but I don't hate it. When I look at this Pokemon, I don't think, why would a merciful and all-encompassing god create such a monstrosity? I don't even think about its strange chopstick noodle arms or the fact that when it crawls, it sends literal shudders down the fabric of my entire physical being. No, when I look at this Pokemon, I just think, meh. So I hunted for an ungodly amount of time with a lot of other potential encounters. But after seven hours of relentlessly running in circles, we actually found who we were looking for first try with no RNG manipulation whatsoever. Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Yes, found it. <laughs> this, this is our first member. We can play the game. Moving forward, I knew that if I was going to beat Katie, my ball of yarn was not going to be strong enough. Luckily for me, though, Bug-type Pokemon evolved ridiculously early in the game. So, after talking to a strange man at the Pokemon Center, we came to an agreement. If I beat up five children for him, he'll source me the TM for Aerial Ace, which seems fair enough, right? Since Spidops is not a flying type, Aerial Ace won't be stabbed, so to compensate, I decided to pick up a sharp beak before taking on the Bug Lady. So, after scavenging for the necessary gear and doing some training, the thing that I was hoping would happen finally happened. Look at Thoth, bro, he's so pink! With Thoth now ready to take on the first gym, we make our way to Cortondo for arguably the biggest challenge in this entire run. Honestly, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Okay! Ah! Now, with the hard part of the game behind us, let's go show Katie who the real Bug Whisperer is. Katie leads the fight with Nimble, which is an easy one-shot for Thoth. She then brings out Thoth's predecessor, who surprisingly survives a sharp beat boosted aerial ace. She retaliates with a measly bug bite that deals a whopping 7 damage. So after taking it out with another hit, she sends out her ace, Teddy Ursa. Knowing that the Teddy outspeeds Thoth, I use Silk Trap to negate its first move and to lower its speed. Enough so that Thoth can go first now, so the next turn Thoth does actually move first and we get a clean aerial ace in, which looks like a two shot, so as long as we survive the next hit, we win. Easy peasy, we take the battle and with that the badge. And now the entire Paldea region knows there can be only one. I. I'm the Bug Whisperer. Okay, so as much as I'd like to spread out these encounters as much as possible, we're using objectively the weakest type in there is. So if I'm being real, I need all the firepower I can get my hands on. With that in mind though, I can hunt for my favorite bug type to come from this generation. I'd actually go as far as to say that this bug type is in my top three, like, Ever. Anyway, after running around for the majority of the day finding absolutely nothing, eventually this little guy shows up. Oh my god, wait, that that's it. <laughs> I just logged back on and, and it's just there. Such a fun. Okay, cool. I'm gonna call you Anubis. Nimble and Low Kicks are both physical attackers, and near Cortondo, I picked up the Adamant Mint. So I fed a piece of candy, which is probably bigger than the Pokemon itself, to Anubis so that he can hit a little bit harder. And so with that, it's time to take on honestly just a terrifying fight for this run. Cloth doesn't usually pose much of an issue for me, but my Pokemon aren't just bad they're extremely weak to rock types, which Cloth is. At first I was panicking trying to come up with a tactic, but then I saw what Thoth could learn. So yes, Thoth can use Silk Trap to make the Cloth slower, but he can also learn Low Kick, which in this case is a godsend. Low Kick does just over a third of the Titan's HP, and then it just opts to use Block. Another Low Kick gets real close to taking it out, but instead it activates Anger Shell. And so after taking a solid hit from Vi's Grip, we Silk Trap again to lower the beast speed to make sure that we outspeed, and then we click Giga Drain, which apparently Thoth can also learn. So so with that, we can heal up and leap into the second phase of the fight. Cloth gets ready by eating some drugs and it's time for phase two. I lead Nimble and start by taking a block, preventing me from running away. Then I retaliate with a screech, harshly lowering the Titan's defense. Arvin, surprisingly, decides to be helpful and uses Water Gun. The Cloth, clearly feeling lonely, also prevents Shelder from running away. That lets me get another screech off to lower the Cloth to negative four. Arvin then hits him with another Water Gun, getting some more chip damage in. The Crab targets the Clam, Anubis double kicks, and the Cloth's Anger Shell is activated again. Which is scary, because Anubis 
just doesn't have the greatest defense stat. I mean, it's a bug. A water gun from Shieldor puts Cloth at a killing range. The crab then hits Arvin's Pokemon with a brutal rock smash, and I finish the battle with a final double kick. I have absolutely no idea how I'm saying this, but we make it out with no casualties. We enter the crab's abode, make some sort of glowing mushroom sandwich, I fed one to my semi-automatic horse, and we can promptly move on. So with that done and dusted, we make our way to Artisan, where we face our next gruesome challenge, collecting sunflowers. And then I guess we'll fight the Brassius guy. You know, if we have time. <clears throat> Brassius jumps down from the windmill, miraculously with both legs still intact. He leads with Petal out, and I start off the battle with Thoth. I decided that my best bet was to Terrastalize straight away for the bonus damage and use Bug Bite. Petal out false. Brassius proceeds to send out an Olive, who also gets one shot. Now it's time to face Pseudo Widow, which is scary because it gets Stab Rock type moves. And we've only got bugs. I use Silk Trap to lower its speed and guarantee that we attack first. A Struggle Bug then leaves Pseudo Widow at half health. But then he retaliates with a hard rock throw that leaves Thoth on a measly. 20 HP. Out of pure fear, I silk trap again to absolutely make sure no stat changes or speed ties could allow the pseudo widow to move first. Finally, I finish off the battle with another struggle bug sending the fake tree six feet under. Okay, so hear me out, right? The next fight is absolutely the hardest checkpoint of this entire Nuzlocke. The open sky titan bombardier. Now, bombardier is unequivocally the scariest for a multitude of reasons. One, bombardier is a flying type and we only have bugs. Two, bombardier's ability, rocky payload, means that his rock moves also get stabbed. And bugs are weak to rock. And finally, three, this is the only Titan fight that we're not allowed to heal between phases. Are you serious? How am I supposed to do this? It's fairly obvious that I'm gonna need to pick up a new friend if we want to beat the bird. But before catching our next bug type, a strange man on a beach gave me an Eviolite. For those of you who don't know, an Eviolite boosts the defense and special defense of a Pokemon holding it by 50%, provided that Pokemon can still evolve. I know if I want to beat the Stork, I need all the help I can get. And so with that out of the way, the Shiny Hunt begins. <gasps> oh, combi, shiny combi. Wait, is it male or female? Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Oh no! Oh no! That sucks! But it's so obvious, isn't it? That's a such a cool shiny. But it's so unfortunate that this is the single most useless Pokemon of all time. <laughs> um, you look, you look wrong. I'm gonna... I, I think this is a shiny. <laughs> no! Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. Oh no, oh no. Is it male? Please be female, please, 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 please be female, please be female. Uh, why? Uh, ugh, yucky. Shiny Smolov, Shiny Smolov. Guys? That's the Shiny Smolov right there. Uh, that's insane. How the hell did you spot that? Because the Black Olive. That's insane. We're not recording. It took so long. Oh Mom cheeks, God. other cheeks, and we won. <laughs> Oh my god, we missed the reaction! This thing caused so much pain, and it's such a bad Pokemon! It's over! Heck yeah! Krikatot's absolutely a game. It's definitely just gonna die to Bombardier. <laughs> it's absolutely gonna die. Before we face Bombi, there's a few last things that I need to do. You know, to give myself the best chance of not losing the entire lock. He's actually kind of adorable, but also he took up so much time. So much time. <laughs> Okay, here goes. Knowing that Bombardier absolutely outspeeds everyone, I lead Thoth so that I can use Rock Tomb to lower her speed. But, um, we get hit by just an insane wing attack that puts us in such a horrible position. The Rock Tomb thankfully lands, bringing her to nearly half health and lowering her speed. Then I'm left praying that Thoth outspeeds the bird, and so I tried to get another Rock Tomb off. If I'm gonna win this battle, I know that I'm gonna have to risk sacrificing anyone at any given moment. And, uh, unfortunately, we don't outspeed the Bombardier, which means that... Oh, wait! He used Rock Throw and he missed. What? That's insane. And that means that I can get the final Rock Tomb off, meaning that we outspeed the next turn and win phase one. Holy crap. It's actually working, sort of. Oof, it's not over yet, but it's looking sort of promising. We start phase two off with a barely still alive Spidops. And I click Silk Trap to avoid an instant death and lower the Sky Titan's speed. But unfortunately, the bird decides to attack Arvin's Nackley, meaning that the Silk Trap was for nothing. Nackley uses Rock Throw, dealing a decent bit of damage. And see, this is where I'm left with a horrible decision because I can't Silk Trap twice in a row. I know that if I switch out to any of my other Pokemon, they're absolutely gonna get one shot if they get targeted. So with that, I knew that I had to risk Thoth's life. I click Rock Throw in the hopes that maybe Bombardier targets the Nackley, but unfortunately the bird attacks first and, well, you know. <sighs> I will never forget the sacrifice you made today, Thoth. Rest in peace, Thoth, in the chat. Fly high, my friend. <laughs> Nackley chucks another rock at the bird, leaving it at just above half health. So listen, bum cheeks can't evolve because only a female combi can become a Vespaquin. So if I'm being real, I, I brought him as fodder, as sad as that sounds. Hence the name bum cheeks. 
He's, he's bum cheeks. Maybe he can get lucky and land some chip damage, but his whole purpose is just to stall out the bird as much as possible so that we can hopefully make it out of this battle with someone alive. Bombardier lands a crit on the Knackley, leaving it at 22 health, which means that bum cheeks is safe to land a bug bite. At this point, I was relying on Knackley to keep on hitting Bombardier with rock throws as none of Cheeks' moves were doing really anything at all. Luckily, Arvin steps up and uses rock throw again, leaving the bird at virtually no health. The bird targets Knackley again, allowing me to get another bug bite off, which actually wins the battle. Bum cheeks survived. How the hell did that happen? We walk into another mysterious cave, find more glowing plants for more obscure glowing sandwiches, but before we move on, a few moments for our fallen soldier. Now that we're down to three Pokemon, it's time to look for another insect to help us on our quest. This time, I hunted for an obscene amount of time under the Metzagosa gates. Wait, 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 that's it, that's it, that's it. No. That's it, that's it, finally. Oh my god, that's it. Oh my god, you took so long. Ah. It's so obvious as well. There's no way we missed it. Yeah. There's no way we missed it. Oh my god. Yes, it's over. Shiny Surskip, finally. Our next battle is up against the notoriously difficult Giacomo, aka Kevin. Before we enter the treacherous gates of the Dark Crew camp, I grab a wide lens because I honestly don't think that I can afford any misses. And see, a wide lens boosts a Pokemon's accuracy by 10%. I'm still playing with RNG, but I'm just trying to tip the scales a little bit more in my favour. I lead with Geb, who, can I just say, has such an exquisite moustache. It's sensational. It's magnificent. It's tremendous. It's remarkable. It's phenomenal. It's synonyms. <laughs> I click sing, and thanks to the wide lens, our accuracy is slightly raised, and we land the first one. Essentially, we had two attempts at that, and if we missed both, the run was dead. Now we're moderately free to set up with three swords dances, but unfortunately, on the turn that Ponyard wakes up, we take a massive blow from Ponyard's aerial ace. Now, knowing that we outspeed, I commit the terror on Geb and use Leech Life to get back some of the HP that we lost. Here's where things get crazy, because surprisingly, that one-shot the Ponyard and nearly brought us back up to full health. Then the Reverb Room comes out. How is this a Pokemon? We take a Wicked Torque, which lands a decent chunk of damage, but that's no problem for our friendly neighbor, Geb, as he, get this, one-shots the Land Rover. Who knew the Geb of all gentlemen would be able to sweep so easily? I underestimated this bug and his mustache, and I will never be doing that again. Wow. We continue our journey with Iono and the Electric Gym in our sights. But I think first it's time to hunt for another teammate, probably our most important teammate in this entire run, Scyther. See, if we want to have a chance at this, Scyther's help is going to be essential. Before hunting, however, I realized that with the new cap, one of our other bugs can evolve. Oh, Nath, let's go! <laughs> so now, with a slightly less pathetic team, let the hunt commence. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, yes, 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 it's shiny! Ah, I found it! Hi, mate! Oh, I feel like forever. There's so many scythers just everywhere. You're not even subtle. I'm a fan. I like it. Okay, cool. Sick. Sick, sick, sick. Amazing. Before heading to Lavincia City, there was a few more things that I needed to check off. See, Scyther doesn't evolve by level up, but instead, all he needs is a metal coat from Delibird Presence and to be traded to a friend. And I thought the sooner I did that, the more possible the rest of the run was gonna be. Plus, the next gem we face is Electric, and Scyther's a flying type, which, yeah, just isn't ideal, to be honest. Okay, so see, in theory, Sobek should evolve now. Bro, I love the color of this Scyther. I know it's like such a subtle difference, but see that difference in green? I love it. See you later, Sobek. I knew Sobek. God, see the matte finish on this scissor. It's beautiful. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I would love for you to meet the new inevitable MVP of this run, Sobek the Scissor. The next part of our journey still required a few more items, so I went on a hunt to grab the TM for Swords Dance and pay another visit to Daily Bird Presence. So then I fought Nimona, I beat Nimona, and then while training, Anubis evolved. And with that, I'm finally ready to fight Iono. Iono leads with Watro and I send out Neath the Masquerain. Uniquely, Masquerain can learn the move Ice Beam, and in combination with the Never Melt Ice, Masquerain manages to one-shot the bird. Iono sends out Belly Boat and I switch to Geb on an oncoming spark. I click Sing and yet again the wide lens comes through and it lands on the first try sending Belly Boat to sleep. Geb gets three swords dances up before Belly Boat arose from his slumber to land another spark. But see, that's okay, Geb isn't actually the Pokemon who's gonna take this home. We baton pass over to Sobek taking a spark in the process. Still, by the way, managing to avoid the para. The baton pass allowed Geb to carry over the attack boost to Sobek and with his outrageous speed I commit to my terror. Then click X Scissor which one shots the Belly Boat. Iono sends out Loxio who has intimidate. Nevertheless, we still manage to one-shot. Then Miss Magus is last, who outspeeds Sobek and lands a Confuse Ray. Luckily for us, though, Sobek manages to power through the Confusion and one-shots the Ghosty. After humiliating Iono live on stream, we take our badge and with no wasted time, continue our journey of the Paldea region. So, yeah, Sobek was amazing for Iono, but do you know who we need to fight next? Mela, the fire one, with a four-wheel drive star mobile birthed from the fiery depths of hell. Honestly, though, the fire crew does pose a serious threat. Sobek is times four weak to fire types, so 
we need to look to our other bugs to try and take this out. With that in mind, I head to Mezzagosa to buy the mystic water to give to Masquerain. And I taught Raindance to Geb and to Neath. I also nabbed the TM for Surf to give to Masquerain, and with that, we make our way to Mela, ready to... Let's be honest, probably lose the run. Mela leads her Torko and we lead Geb, setting up a rain dance straight off the bat. Geb takes a flame wheel which does 32 points of damage. Then we manage to put Torko to sleep, which allows me to switch into Neath without taking any damage. Neath then uses a Mystic Water boosted Surf, which manages to one shot the Torko, meaning all this left is the car. The car leads with a screech, which is terrifying. Nevertheless, we manage to land a surf. The river room lands a blazing torque, which puts Neath down to 19 HP and unfortunately burns her. Luckily, though, since surf is special, it doesn't matter too much, so another one lands putting the car at close to no health. And at this point, see, I knew that Neath couldn't take another blazing torque. And so, regretfully, it's time. I switch into Bum Cheeks knowing that I need a clean switch or one of our real teammates goes down. Devastatingly, Bum Cheeks falls. What a hero. What a tasty, tasty hero. We get a clean switch out to low kicks, then the car uses overheat but misses. Anubis then uses double kick putting the car on 1 HP and raising his speed again. Please don't tell me I'm about to lose low kicks as well, man. Mela throws and uses Screech for whatever reason, and we are able to get off another double kick, putting an end to Mela's reign. Anyway, we grab our badge and we're off again, traversing the land of Paldea, searching for the next man, woman or child who stands in our way. But of course, first, we need to pay our respects. Before we face the big boy damn steel titan, I teach low kicks to low kick. No wait, no. I teach low kick to low kicks. There we go. How fitting! Then it's time to fight Orthworm. Anubis lands a massive low kick, Orth uses rap, and we shut him down with a second low kick. Phase two is imminent. The worm eats the plant, making him abundantly stronger. Regardless, Arvin joins us and we're off to some more fisticuffs. The first low kick from low kicks does a good bit of damage, followed up with Orthworm dealing a massive headbutt to Arvin's toad school. Arvin then retaliates with a supersonic that misses. We low kick again and the worm goes for sandstorm. Arvin then actually helps by using Screech, allowing Anubis's final low kick to seal the deal. The Titan falls and we press on into his cave, feed our donkey and get out of there. It's time to make our way towards Porto Marinada, a wholesome little town off the northwestern docks of Paldea, so that we can run an errand to grant us access to fight the water gym leader, Kofu. On our travels, we teach Scizor Trailblaze for some super effective damage at the water gym and the utility of the speed boost. We also grab a miracle seed to get the most out of it. So now it's off to the Marinada market to bid on some seaweed in exchange for a battle. I guess. In the spirit of Kofu's facial hair, we send out Geb against Veluza. On the first turn, we again manage to land a sing on the first try. Thank you, Wade Lens. Geb manages to set up two swords dances before Baton passing over to Sobek. Veluza wakes up on that turn and does quite a bit of damage with Pluck, before landing an Aqua Cutter, leaving us on 38 HP. Luckily, though, with our plus four attack boost, we manage to land a Trailblaze, one-shotting the Veluza and raising our speed. Kofu sends out Wug Wug. And since Wug Trio's literally Lightning McQueen, Sobek doesn't outspeed and takes a Water Pulse as a result. We don't get confused and land another Trailblaze sending Wugwug to its demise. Crabominable comes out, and although Sobex low, I know that with the plus 4 attack and plus 2 speed, we will comfortably outspeed this Pokemon and land the Trailblaze to one shot. So with that, we're four badges down. So far, so good. Without hesitation, I put the Metal Coat on Sobek, and we press forth towards the next fight. Since Poison doesn't affect Steel types, I think I have a pretty good idea of what my answer to Atticus might be. See, in most runs, Atticus is such a problem. I hate him. I don't hate things, but I hate him. But listen, not in this case. In this case, He's gonna be a cakewalk. Atticus comes out from behind the curtains and the show begins. We lead Sobek and he brings out his Skuntag. See, Skuntag's only move that affects Sobek is Sucker Punch. And that means the only way for him to land an attack is if we attack first. So I'm not gonna attack. We manage to get off three iron defenses followed promptly by three swords dances. Then we floor the Skuntag with a metal coat boosted bullet punch. Atticus brings out Revivroom Jr. who manages to eat one of Sobek's bullet punches. Then he iron heads in retaliation and we finish him off with yet another bullet punch. Muck comes out who swiftly melts to another bullet punch. Then Atticus brings out his real threat, Revivroom Senior. In this specific case though, it isn't too much of a threat. We bullet punch to do a healthy chunk of damage and sure we take a flame charge, but that doesn't do too much. One more bullet punch seals the deal and there we have it, dog water doo doo bum cheeks, a plague on your house good sir. I'll be seeing you never. Now I'm sure a lot of you guys are asking why I continuously use bullet punch on Sobek and the answer to that comes in the form of his ability. Because you see my friend, Sobek has the ability Technician and what Technician does is it powers up weaker moves and Bullet Punch falls within that category. So it turns a 40 base power priority move into a 60 base power priority move. Now if we add the stab boost on top of that followed by the Metal Coat, it just does a lot of damage. I mean, you saw it for yourself, it two shot the River Room. Anyway, in celebration of an easy Atticus dub, I want to hunt for my next shiny insect. And this is one I've been really excited for because in my opinion, this is the single best shiny to come from Generation 9. You will not convince me otherwise. See, normally, Relor rolls around with this humble ball of poo. However, with its shiny, Pokemon did something incredibly interesting and genuinely hilarious in my eyes. So many of them, man. It's just...
Oh! <laughs> look at it! Oh, look at your golden nugget! You're fantastic! Look at that texture! <laughs> You're fantastic! Look at his little feet. They're not even his hands. He's rolling around with his feet. Oh, I love it so much. You're such a good shiny. You're such a good shiny. You're the best. You actually might be the best shiny. I'm gonna call you Nephthys. So with the new addition to our family, everything's slowly coming together. But before moving on, I snagged the TM for Brick Break and taught it to my old buddy Anubis. I also gave Sobek a Chestoberry in preparation for the next fight. So I head to a restaurant in Medali, order a medium serving of Fire Blast style grilled rice balls with a bit of lemon on top. Not gonna lie, that sounds scrumptious. But some old dude decides to interrupt me before I can eat my meal. How rude. He tells me that apparently he's a crowd favorite and that everyone loves him, but in my eyes, that shouldn't give him the right to interrupt my meal. I challenge him to a scrimmage to settle this debate. He accepts and we get ready to conduct some business. So let's do it. Lorenzo leads Kamala, I lead Sobek. We start off mitigating his sucker punch by using iron defense. Then Kamala yawns at me and we set up another iron defense. Next turn, we dodge a sucker punch and use swords dance all before falling asleep. Luckily though, we prepared for this and so Sobek's Chestoberry woke him up pronto. But next turn, we take another yawn. Sick. After a bunch more back and forth nonsense, sleeping, waking up, falling back asleep, etc, etc, we finally get off a brick break which floors the koala. Larry brings out Dud Unsparse, which is no match for Sobek and dies to a singular brick break. Larry brings out his ace, Staraptor, who manages to outspeed landing a pathetic aerial ace. And Sobek gets another clean and fruitful one shot. What a Pokemon. So after leaving the restaurant, we make our way towards Rhyme in the snowy city of M Montin. Montener Montenervera. Montenervera. Montenervera? Mont Montenevera. Monternevera. Don't judge me. Anyway, we're asked to warm up the crowd, which is a pretty daunting task, considering this is a city atop a mountain, at a ridiculous altitude in the glacial cold. Anyway, we do what he asks and commence in a few double battles, which we steamroll. But unfortunately, Neath overlevels in the process, meaning we'll have one less Pokemon for that battle. And a pretty great one at that. I mean, Neath's speed stat alone is so great, so to lose that isn't the most ideal. Regardless, I get back onto the stage and proceed to get absolutely flamed by the gym leader for absolutely no reason. My bugs and I will not be disrespected like this. This is slander. And so at a matter of pride, a challenger to a battle. I lead Geb and Sobek. Rain brings out Mimikyu and Bayonet. The Mimikyu uses Shadow Sneak, dealing a small amount of damage to Sobek, and Bayonet uses Sucker Punch, but it fails since we didn't use an attacking move. Both Geb and Sobek use Swords Dance, and Bayonet fails another Sucker Punch. Mimikyu then hits Geb with a Slash, dealing exactly 30 damage. The Mustache and Scissor combo go for another Double Swords Dance, getting both of their attack stats to plus 4. Then the next turn, Sobek takes takes a sucker punch from the bayonet, then hits a Mimikyu with a bullet punch to get rid of its disguise. Geb takes a slash and baton passes over to Anubis. Sobek then takes a pretty scary shadow sneak from Mimikyu, but lands a bullet punch in return to take it out. Lokex then outspeeds the bayonet and lands an assurance that floors it in one shot. Rhyme sends out her final two Pokemon, Toxtricity and Houndstone. Tox terastalizes. Sobek bullet punches the Houndstone, taking it out in one shot, no problem. Lokex then uses assurance on her ace and that is that. With the run becoming increasingly strenuous on my brain, I looked over at my bugs to let them know. Regardless of where this run takes us, I'm proud of you. Of how far we've come. They doubted us. What we're capable of. Now look. Still though, there's a long way to go if we want to make history. The quaking Earth Titan is next and he's quaking in his boots. This is the penultimate Titan that we need to face and he knows we mean business. Neath's Intimidate puts Great Tusk's attack to minus one before we even start the battle. Tusk uses Rapid Spin, not doing a whole lot of damage, and we fire back with a Chilling Water which puts the Titan at just above half health. But this all also lowered its attack even farther, bringing the Mammoth to minus two. Neath manages to dodge a Brick Break and use Surf one time to take it out. With that, we heal up and make our way to the second phase. The Raging Earth Elephant eats some glowing mushrooms and Arvin comes to my aid. Tusk focuses Arvin's Scoville and uses Knock Off. The two-headed Bell Pepper uses Scary Face, which harshly lowers the Mammoth's speed. We then use Chilling Water to do a bit of damage and lower its attack yet again, putting Neath in a pretty confident position. Scoville then lands a Crit Razor Leaf, which honestly doesn't do as much damage as I thought it would. Hey ho. We land another chilling water, lowering its attack one more time. Tusk uses rapid spin and only manages to do 16 points of damage. Then we hit one final surf to take out the titan and with that, the great Tusk is done. You know the drill by now. Arvin and I head into the cave. He feeds his pet. I feed my dinosaur horse bicycle. And then I traverse my way through the harsh terrains of Paldea to prepare myself to take on Tulip. See, she isn't just a pretty face. She has an honest to god terrifying group of Pokemon and could honestly be a pretty huge threat to my guys. Although the benefit we've got here is that bugs typically are strong against psychic Pokemon. 
Pokemon, they're just less strong in general, I guess. We get to Alphornada, I do some stretching, and I'm ready to get my Pilates on. Once I comfortably outdance everyone in the gym trial, I head up to the battlefield ready to, well, hello, sexy lady. Tulip sends out for Rigoraf, and we lead with Geb. We set up a swords dance, and then we manage to avoid a Zen headbutt. Solid stuff. We get up another swords dance undamaged as the Furigraph goes for Reflect. Geb pulls through with the final swords dance and takes a solid Zen headbutt, putting him at less than half health. Now, to make sure that we don't risk our favorite mustache, we tag in Sobek with a baton pass. Since Psychic isn't very effective on steel, he doesn't take too much damage on the switch. With his attack stat maxed out, I use Iron Defense, which makes the oncoming crunch do minimal damage. Sobek then uses Trailblaze to get the Giraffe to under half health and raise our speed in the process. We get crunched again, but that's fine. The Reflect wears off, and since now we have a speed advantage, I have Sobek use Trailblaze another time to prevent another Reflect being put up, and he gets another speed boost. The Giraffe falls and Chulip brings out his Pathra. Sobek comfortably outspeeds and one-shots the Emu with X Scissor. Then Chulip brings out her Waifu. One X Scissor does the trick and Gardevoir falls. It's time to face off against her final Pokemon who just so happens to be a bouquet of flowers that doubles as a harbinger of sheer unadulterated unfiltered death. But our Sobek has this in the bag. I commit the terror and comfortably take her out with one fatal X Scissor. Chulip was so impressed by my battle and prowess that she dropped to her knees and proposed to me on the spot. But listen, Destiny and I have other plans. I had to regretfully decline, take the badge, and forever remember this as the tragic day I had to humiliate my one true chance at love. <sighs> Moving on, we've only got one more gym leader to defeat before we've collected all eight gym badges. So we make our way up the steep Monroes of Glaciado and prepare to take on Grusha in an all or nothing staring contest with the most obscenely pretty eyes I've ever seen. And see, that's where I messed up because Grusha and I were hitting it off like really well and I stupidly forgot to rename Chulop on my phone. So when she texted me saying that she missed me, things got a little bit awkward and Grusha thought that I was doing the naughties behind his back. And so before I could even get a word in, he forced his Pokemon at me and what came next was just an act of self defense. Frostmoth versus Sobek. I don't want to have to do this. Regardless, Frostmoth opens up with a tailwind and we use the first turn to set up a light screen as Frostmoth only has special attacks. Now, although Frostmoth is a special attacker, Grusha's next two Pokemon before his ace are physical attackers. So we take a hit from Blizzard and set up an iron defense. Frostmoth then goes for another Blizzard, but with luck on our side, Scizor dodges it and sets up a swords dance. Frostmoth deals another chunk of damage with Blizzard and we get off a second swords dance. Frostmoth's tailwind peters out, so they set up another and we get a second iron defense in, without taking any more damage. Our light screen then runs out, and instead of setting up another one, we dodge the next blizzard and use iron defense to max out our defense stat. Another blizzard lands, and because we don't have a light screen up, it takes Sobek down to 43 HP before we set up our final swords dance. Now, since Grusha still has his tailwind up, I decide to use bullet punch for the priority and take the frost moth out without taking any more unnecessary damage. Beartick comes in, Beartick gets one shot. Satitan comes in, Satitan gets one shot. Altaria is last, Grusha terastalizes his final Pokemon to an ice type, and after one single bullet punch from Sobek, Altaria falls. And see, after that, Grusha didn't even look me in the eyes. He reluctantly handed me the final gym badge and I never heard his voice or shared a glance again. I am heartbroken, unconsolable, irreparable. <clears throat> Before we take on the last few checkpoints, I think we're ready to find another bug. See, I held off of this one until now because I had to make sure that it could survive until it's <laughs> I had to make sure that it could survive until it's insanely late evolution level. Gosh, I can't speak today. We're hunting for Larvesta. And so it's time to make our way back to Asado Desert where we found our last edition, Relore. 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 Relore feels right, right? I sure hope so. Volcarona will absolutely play an essential role in helping us do this. So let's hunt. Listen, the audio cut out on this one. I'm really sorry but this is the Shiny Larvesta clip. At least the footage didn't corrupt, but the audio sounds ridiculous. So listen, uh, subscribe, because Shiny Larvesta and all the other full-odd Shinies that we found. Uh, and this is a very hard video to do, and it took a long time. So I appreciate your support. Okay, bye. Now, before heading in to take on the Fairy Crew, I taught Rabska Reflect just to try and make this a little bit easier. Anyway, we face Azu with our Rabska to start off the battle. Azu uses Bounce, and before it lands back down, we set up a Reflect. We take the hit on the following turn, conceding a decent bit of damage, and unfortunately, Rabska gets paralyzed. Fortunately, however, Rabska has the ability Synchronize, which means Azu gets paralyzed as well. Nephthys uses Sand Attack, and Azu uses Charm, harshly lowering our attack. But see, that's fine with me as we go for another Sand Attack. Azu uses another Charm, we use another sand attack. Pretty
pretty standard boring stuff. Azu then uses bounce so Rabscum misses and our reflect wears off. See, Nephthys gets hit by the bounce and that puts him on literally one HP. Bro, I cannot express how much my heart just sank. I thought we were about to lose Nephthys in the first battle we've actually used him. He just wanted a little bit of screen time, damn. So without any hesitation, we switch Rabska out for Sobek to start setting up. Even though we don't have a reflect up, the Azu is fully paralyzed and down to an accuracy. Ortega clicks bounce again and we use iron defense before it tries to land back down, but Azu misses the attack. We use another iron defense and manage to dodge an aqua tail, which means Nephthys was useful. Who would have thunk it? We set up our final iron defense before Azu gets full parried. Then we managed to set up a couple of swords dances without taking any unnecessary damage before we bullet punch, taking it out in one hit. Dash Bun comes out, Dash Bun gets floored. Wigglytuff comes out and Wigglytuff gets floored. And then the Starmobile comes in and gets smacked up by one single bullet punch. Sobek is unparalleled. Now, although the start of that battle was pretty shaky, we walk away undefeated, unscathed and unfazed. After a bit of R&R, &R, my bugs and I were ready to get back on the horse. And so we head on out to take on the not quite a dragon titan Don Dozo. So let's fight a whale, shall we? I lead our MVP and click Swords Dance turn one. We get hit by a water pulse, but don't get confused. Then a Trailblaze does an insane amount of damage to the titan. And so after brushing off another hit, we use Trailblaze once again to one shot the titan. He runs away, we chase him and it's time for phase two. The whale gives me whiplash, the sushi disappears into the cave, my bro pulls up, the whale eats the fish and I have no idea what's going on. Let's fight! I click Swords Dance and the behemoth targets the Greedent. Next turn, I use Trailblaze, which again does just an insane amount of damage. One more floors it and apparently now the fish wants to catch some scissors as well. Tatsushimi outspeeds and uses Icy Wind and I click Trailblaze, which this time round does almost nothing. It's okay though, Tatsu isn't doing a whole lot of damage to us, so I opt to Swords Dance just to get some more damage off in the oncoming turns. So then the next Trailblaze does a decent chunk. Tatsu obliterates the Greedent and Sobek doesn't like when you go after his mates, so he absolutely smacks down the fish in return. We go into the cave to get what we came for. Mm. Drugs. We take a photo, feed our bicycle, or I guess since it's a quadruped, I should call it a, a quadcycle? Quasical? I don't know. Anyway, we're ready to press on and get this end game rolling. We can do this. I know we can. Before moving on, I decided that it was high time that we pick up another bug. And this shiny is magnificent. I love it. 10 out of 10 shiny. Yes, absolutely. Wood shiny again. Oh, there she is. Hi, mate. Hello, Heracross. How's it going? Ah, oh, there's too many. Stop it. Get out of my face. Stop running away. Come back. You're so pink. Okay, now I snag the TM for Cam Mind and the TM for Trick Room before heading forth to take on Erai and her team of bandits. And her camper van. The ACDC reject leads her Toxicroak and I lead Nephthys. Turn 1, I opt to use Cam Mind because realistically I know that the frog wants to use Sucker Punch. Which gives me just an incredible opportunity to Cam Mind up. I use it 4 times without taking a lick of damage and then use Trick Room on Toxicroak's final Sucker Punch. Which puts Nephthys in just a magnificent position. One Psychic absolutely obliterates the Toxicroak and that baits Lucario. But once Psychic sends it swiftly to its grave. Then Annihilate comes in. This is a massacre. Nephthys, I did not think you had this in you. But Simeon goes down. Good lord. Finally though, Erai brings out her ace, the Starmobile. And Nephthys, in her blaze of glory, uses Psychic one last time and absolutely floors the final car of this run. I have no words for just how beautiful that sweep was. Yes, sir. On that note, there were so many bugs that I wanted to try out. I I've caught the fever. I honestly can't lie. I think I'm a bug trainer now. Remember those guys with the jungle hat in the net? I'm one of them now. Bug catcher gentle dude. Yep, that is me and you will refer to me as such. Anyway, listen, I hunted for almost an entire day for a stupid fortress and something incredibly dumb happened. Oh, uh, um, was that, was that it? Why? 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 After that kerfuffle, I just honestly couldn't bring myself to hunt again. So I pressed on with no new bug types. Heartbreaking, I know. And so to ease my sorrows, I evolved Tefnot the Larvesta into Tefnot the unfiltered hyperactive Moab and snagged the TM for Giga Drain. With all that said and done, I started my prep for the Elite Four. But while that's going on in the background, I want to take this opportunity to ask you to subscribe. Because listen, as of when I'm making this video, I am only 977,263 subscribers away from 1 million. Help me out. Alright, cool. No more shameless self-promo. Let's run this. Rika is up first. She leads Whiskash and I start off with Tefnut, who I freshly fed the TM Giga Drain. Now, turn one, I terastalize to the pure bug type so that I can use Quiver Dance without worrying about the ground or water weakness. And so, for the first few turns, it's a back and forth between Whiskash using Muddy Water and Tefnut using Quiver Dance. Eventually, though, I feel like I'm in a good enough spot and don't want to risk any more accuracy drops, so I click Giga Drain with the big root in hand and we get back up to full easily and one-shot the Whiskash. Camera 
Sharp comes in, and on the first turn, we miss a Giga Drain and get hit by a Yawn, which I don't like, especially considering that Tefnot is who we set up with. So the following turn, I use Amnesia because I want to take as little damage as possible. Then, with Tefnot asleep, Camera Opt hits a Fire Blast, which does next to nothing. But listen, I really, really don't want to know what will happen if we get crit. Camera Opt hits another, no crit, and then another. No crit. Come on, Tef, not wake up. Finally, okay. I use Giga Drain, which cleanly one-shots the Lava Camel, and that beats Donphan. I use Giga Drain, which activates a Sturdy, and then the next turn, we miss, and Donphan hits just a devastating Stone Edge. But then a Giga Drain finishes it off. On Doug Trio, I decide to risk the miss because of the single accuracy drop from earlier, because I don't think anyone could take this endgame better than Tefnot can. Listen, that might be stupid of me, but it pays off. We one-shot, and the Claude comes in. It terrestrializes and protects turn one, which, to be frank, is dumb. But next turn, I land a hard Giga Drain, and then avoid an oncoming Earthquake, which means one more G-Drain seals it, and that settles that. One down, three to go. Moving swiftly on, it's time to beat up a toddler's Pokemon. <laughs> She leads an elephant, I lead a floating dung beetle scarab thing. Turn 1, Nephthys uses Reflect, and Copperaja uses Stealth Rocks, which sorta of sucks because apparently bugs don't like rocks. Anyway, Nephthys is, 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 Nephthys is, Nephthys is entire role here is to pivot between Sand Attack and Protect for Leftovers Recovery. And so that's exactly what we do. We want to lower this thing's accuracy as much as we conceivably can. We take a bunch of heavy slams along the way, but we get where we need to get before the elephant starts opting for high horsepower. So I protect stall until the Reflect wears off, and then set up another before switching Nephthys out. Who else but Sobek? Am I right? I set up some iron defenses on the switch, avoiding every attack coming our way. Then, I follow that up with three swords dances. This is going swimmingly. Finally, the Corporaja lands an attack that does, well, that. Then we one shot with Brick Break and that baits Corvi. It opts for an iron defense so Brick Break does almost exactly 50% and since we dodge the next attack, one more takes it right out. Ronzong comes in for about 3 seconds before being sent swiftly and directly to its grave. Magnezone then comes in but it has sturdy. See the thing is Magnezone usually, unless it sees an obvious kill, uses light screen. Which in this case, it does. And so Brick Break shatters the screen, taking it out. The sturdy made absolutely no difference. Finally the Tinkaton comes out. This thing is scary. Poppy presses the big red terror button and we get outsped and she lands a crit. But Sobek stands strong and eats the hit for breakfast. Goodbye Tinkaton. Goodbye Pops. Two down, two to go. Lareth! Let's cuddle. I mean, cuddle. I mean, fight. What? Tropius versus Neath. Turn one, I know we outspeed, so I never melt ice boosted. Ice beam, that's quite effective, does the trick. Obviously. That beats Staraptor, who has Brave Bird and the attack stat of a double decker bus. So after weighing my options, I decide to stay in and click ice beam. Oh, ah, we don't even have speed. Ah! Wait, Neath toughed it out so you wouldn't feel sad. I hate that I added that mechanic. Neath should be dead right now. Ah, that mechanic hurts my feelings because now Staraptor is going to die and we don't deserve that. We don't deserve that. Neath should be dead. I mean, this runs so hard, but equally, like, that's that's a weird way to win. So, um, Neath toughed it out so we don't feel sad. All right, pause the video for just a second. This mechanic, right? I get it. But that text prompt means that Neath would have died. Should have died. And so, even even though I do win this battle, I let Neath fall and now I had a moral dilemma on my hands. Thanks, Game Freak. She went out swinging, she did a fantastic job, now she's made this video controversial for no reason. God, she's such a diva. Because I don't think we were getting out of that situation that unscathed. Okay, right, I think the only fair way to do this is asking Siri for a number between 1 and 5. I think that if that didn't happen, then we were going to lose that fight. So, we're going to sack someone but we don't get to choose who dies. I'm gonna ask Siri for a number between one and five, and whichever number Siri chooses, from Tefnot down to Anubis, that's who dies. Hey Siri, give me a number between one and five. The answer is five. Oh my god. Okay, that's so bad. Uh, I mean, do you know what? That, that's best case scenario, I think. I think we have to fight it with these four. I think that's it. I think we just have to fight it with these guys. All right, so now we're taking on Mr. Dragon Man with only four bugs. I honestly didn't see it coming to this, but we are where we are, and we fought hard to be here. Whew, okay. Nephthys versus Noivern. In between fights, I gave Nephthys speed swap, and we click that. Then, we actually avoid an attack. Then I click Dazzling Gleam, hoping it'll one-shot, but because it doesn't, we take a hard air slash. Then, I click Protect for Recovery, and follow that up with a final dazzling gleam and because of the speed swap, we outspeed. Haxorus comes out and I click protect. Listen, I need all the HP that I can get. I saw that Hax was going for crunch, so the next turn I opt to use reflect and take a hit. It does a pretty solid amount, so with the reflect up, I thought it was just best to switch. Sobek comes in and I click iron defense a couple of times, knowing that Axe face doesn't have a whole lot in the locker for a scissor. I click swords dance all the while taking hit after hit. Then eventually, I attack and one shot the dragon. See, I know that a plus six attack stab technician boosted 
Metal Coat Boosted Bullet Punch was the best I was gonna get. So I just do that. The Seaweed Falls, the Apple Falls, and finally, Baxcalibur. This game's pseudo comes in. It terastalizes to the pure dragon type, which in this case isn't great for us, but a Bullet Punch does what it needs to do, and Baxcalibur falls. We make it out of the Elite Four, but only by the grace of Geodude. Who knows what would have happened if Neath just fell to the Staraptor in the Larry fight. Regardless, at this point, we have to press on. My bugs are out for blood. We will not stop until we're crowned champions and victors of Paldea. And that means Paldea in its entirety. Gita is on the hit list, but she's not the kingpin. Sada, we're coming for you. One brick at a time, though. Gita! Let's do this. Okay, come on, Gita. Oh, <laughs> it's the wrong door. My bad. Sorry, guys. Sorry. 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 I, I know I'm sorry. My bad. I'm going. Sorry. Okay, let's run it. Gita leads Aspathra and I lead Nephthys. Turn one, Nephthys gets hit by a dazzling gleam and gets a speed swap off. So now Nephthys has a speed stat of an ostrich. I click protect for Lefty's recovery, but Gita sees through that and uses reflect. So I follow that up by lowering Aspathra's accuracy as much as I can, taking next to no damage from her dazzling gleams. That is, when she can actually hit them. I.e. almost never. I get all six sand attacks up before opting to switch to Sobek because I refuse to lose anybody else. I set up to plus with Swords Dance and Espathra gets the Opportunist boost, but that's exactly why I opted for Sobek and not Tefna, because Quiver Dance would look very scary on a purely special Espathra. So I use Agility to make sure that we outspeed Gita's champion team, then the next turn I opt for Brick Break to shatter the screens, then a Bullet Punch sends Espathra down. The Coffee Table comes in but falls to a single Bullet Punch, then the Samurai's brought out. Luckily though, this thing isn't the fastest. A quad effective Brick Break does the job. Vuvuzela comes out and gets punched to oblivion. Gogo comes out and gets punched to oblivion. Finally, the champion's ace comes out and Sobek is faced with an alien rock flower. The flower terastalizes and then gets punched to oblivion. With a team of four, our bugs prevail and we are crowned victors. It feels good, but still there's one looming thought. It's not over. There is still one more obstacle standing between us and real victory. I remember Neith who gave her all to get us to where we are. I remember Anubis who we've raised from but a newt. We do this for them. Now that on the surface we are Paldean champions, I decided to go and try and find the shiny that I failed earlier. Yeah, the fortress. And do you know what happened? I failed it again, bro! Two days of hunting and I failed it again! It was on the screen for one frame! Why does this happen? Nah. I just want a stupid golden fortress. Is that... Too much to ask! <sighs> This time would be different though, because this time I didn't give up. I kept running in circles and eventually one showed up where I needed it to. And so Osiris, Osiris, marks the final shiny bug Pokemon for this run. We take Nimona, Clavel, Penny and Arvin with ease, with a fire in our eyes that burns to tell them that they are but a speed bump in the journey towards a bigger fight. A fight that's gonna take us into the depths of Area Zero, where nothing makes sense. A place where time stands still. Professor Sada waiting for me at his base. <sighs> This is what it comes to. Whatever happens, we got here. That in itself means something. Sada! No more messing around. Let's do what we came to do. AI Sada leads her slither wing and I lead Nephthys. Turn one, I click reflect knowing that a speed swap probably won't matter. Nephthys gets hit by just an incredibly painful lunge. However, we do get the reflect up as intended. So next turn, I switch over to Tefnut who takes a leech life with ease. Tefnut and slither wing share a glance as if maybe they feel related in some weird sort of way. Slither wing doesn't let up though. It keeps fighting. So then after burning the slither wing, I decided to set up with quiver dance. Tefnut holds and takes little damage from the oncoming attack leaving us free to set up how we want to. Once the reflect wears off, I click Fiery Dance to take out the Slitherwing. Now, Fiery Dance is a neat move because it also has a chance at raising one's special attack. So when Fluttermane comes in, I click it again. We one shot and Tefnut gets the boost. Sandy Shocks is next and a single Buzz Buzz, Buzz Bug, Bug, Bug us. Apparently my brain has too many tabs open. A single Bug Buzz takes care of business. Brute Bonnet comes in and hits Tefnut with a hard sucker punch before falling to a quad effective Bug Buzz. Screamtail comes out but falls to one as well. So Finally, Roaring Moon comes in, and this is where I get cocky. Listen, I, I burned the Roaring Moon, and he retaliated with a quad-effective Stone Edge that wipes Tefna off the face of the Earth. And I did that for one single reason. One incredibly stupid, just insanely over-the-top reason. I switch in Osiris, and in his moment, he knows exactly what he's here for. So listen, Osiris... <laughs> Osiris takes a Night Slash, and, um... Please! It didn't even come close. It didn't even come close. Why do we do this? Why do we put ourselves in this position? This is so bad. This was a terrible idea. Bro, one bug buzz and this thing was dead. Okay, so back. If this is how we lose the Nuzlocke, I'm actually gonna cry real tears because that is a throw.
Yes! I thought we were gonna lose. So that was dumb. Listen, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do me a favor and click one of these other videos or just subscribe to the channel or don't do any of those things. But listen, I put a lot of effort into my YouTube channel. I'm trying to be a YouTuber. I'm not a YouTuber yet. I've only got like... <laughs> subscribers, you know? But regardless of what you choose to do or not do, I hope you have a fantastic day. Alrighty then, I'll bloody see you later, pal.